Okay, physics, we are in the fourth week of distance learning. We're halfway through, and this is Monday, May the 18th. Uh, we are going to, uh, last week we studied waves, some of the vocabulary, terminology, some of the equations that go along with waves. And waves are pure energy that have no mass to them. And uh, what we're going to do this week is continue with that by talking about some applications of waves, specifically light waves and sound waves. Uh, so today we're going to talk about light waves and optics. Uh, so this assignment is due uh, next Tuesday, May the 26th, and uh, not accepted after of June the 8th, but that's about the last day of school anyway. So um, if you haven't been keeping up on the assignments, get going. You can still get a good grade, an excellent grade in this class, but you got to get going, get assignments turned in. I am going to hold to the not accepted after dates. I pushed the um, not accepted after assignments that were supposed to be not accepted after today, the 18th of May, I push that back to next uh, Tuesday or Tuesday the 26th. So that's the first not accepted after date, but you got to get things in before that. And that includes the extra credit assignments. So go ahead and do those, get those in before that date, and you can get, uh, get the extra credit. Okay, so we're going to get started on this. Now, there is a... Um, there's a kit that I wanted to use and have you use it and show you how light waves work. It's a really nice little kit with some lasers and some uh, lenses and uh, various um, glassware, plasticware that you can use to bend waves and bend light and see how light works. Unfortunately, it's locked in the classroom. But there is a professor who uh, did a lesson uh, using the exact same kit, and he does, a he does an excellent job of explaining um, these principles of light. So I'm going to go ahead and have you watch that video today and answer some questions. And then uh, we'll continue this tomorrow uh, with the remainder of that video. Welcome to Lecture 4, Seeing the Light. If you think about it, most of your information about the world around you, for most of us anyway, probably comes from light waves. A lot of the rest of it comes from sound, and that means much of our information about the world around us comes from waves of one sort or another. But we can't just get these waves hitting our bodies. We also have to have these waves form images so we can see what it is we're looking at. And we form those images with our own eyes. We also form them with a vast array of instruments from telescopes and microscopes to cameras movie projectors, um, slide viewers, CD players that have to image that laser beam that reads the information off the pits on the CD, and so on and so on. Uh, image forming equipment in nature and in our technological society is really ubiquitous. How do we form images? How do we image? How do we make representations of the world with light waves? Well, the key is in the phenomenon of refraction that I covered in the last lecture. Let me remind you that refraction is the bending of light as it passes from one medium to another. And the example I used last time was this simple rectangular block of plastic. Here I have the same laser I had before, except now it's got five beams coming out instead of one. And we can see that each of these beams, when it enters the block at an angle, uh, bends, in fact, uh, more toward the direction perpendicular to that interface between the air and the glass. There's some funny stuff going on with this one over here. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. But basically those light beams are bent and then they bend back as they come out. That doesn't do much for us in terms of forming images. What we need to do is to develop a shaped object that bends light in such a way that light waves converge on a single point. And an object like that is called a lens. And in this simple demonstration system I have here, I have a number of lenses that have different properties and allow us to understand how this process of image formation works. So let me begin with a simple lens. Again, a lens is an object whose edges are shaped in such a way that this refraction of light occurs to bring light waves together at a single point, or sometimes not to bring them together, as we'll see. So here's an example of a lens. And you can see what that lens does. It takes light rays that are essentially coming in on one side of the lens, all parallel to each other. They hit the first interface between air and glass, air and plastic in this case, and they bend slightly. Um, the one that's hitting head-on in the middle doesn't bend at all, but some of the others bend more, and then they bend again as they go out. And the shapes of those two surfaces are such that the light is brought to a focus at a single point here, and I'm just going to mark that point so we'll have it. And that's called the focal point F of that particular lens. So this lens, lens number one, has the characteristic that it 
takes parallel light and it brings it together at a focus at that single point that I've marked F. In fact, I'm going to call that F1 because that's the focal point for lens number one. And this distance from the lens to that point is called the focal length of the lens or the focal distance. Here's lens two. Lens two, you'll notice, has a little more curvature to its surfaces. It's a stronger lens. It brings light to a focus at a different point. There's f2, the focal point of lens 2. There's the focal distance of lens 2. It's shorter. Um, we characterize lenses, we describe lenses by a single number, namely the focal length or the distance from the lens to its focal point. And that number, or rather the inverse of that number, is something you've probably heard of if you've ever had eyeglasses or contact lenses prescribed. That's the diopter measure of the lenses. For example, I have in my right eye right now a 2.0 diopter contact lens, plus 2.0 diopter. I could have had a minus 2.0 diopter lens, but I wouldn't have been able to see anything if that was the case. More on that in a few minutes. Um, what is that diopter measure? What does that two diopters mean? That's simply the inverse of the focal length in meters. So if I take one over two, that's one half. Um, the focal length of that contact lens is one half a meter. It means if I put that focal length on my board over there, it would be half a meter, about 18 inches, 20 inches roughly, 19, 20 inches, uh, from where the lens was to its focal point. These lenses have considerably shorter focal distances, and therefore, if you take the inverse of their focal distances, you get a bigger number. These are stronger lenses than my contact lens. Um, this distance might be about, oh, six inches. Six inches is about a sixth or seventh of a meter, so this is about a six or seven diopter lens. That's what that diopter measure means. That's positive diopter measurement, so I'll give you a sense in a little bit about what negative diopter measure means also. But the point is we can characterize lenses, these things which are shaped carefully to bend light and bring it together at a common focus, so that um, they, we, we characterize them by that one number that basically tells how quickly or how rapidly in space that happens, how strong the lens is, how quickly it converges those rays together. Now, an ideal lens brings all the rays together right at a single point, and lens 2 is pretty good. All those rays are crossing at that single point marked F2. Lens 1 was a good lens also. All those rays were crossing at that single point marked F1, pretty much crossing at that single point. Uh, lenses aren't perfect. If I have a rather crude lens, this semicircular object, uh, you can see that the rays are definitely not all crossing at the same point. That lens wouldn't do a very good job of bringing light to a focus, and if we tried to form images with it, um, it wouldn't work very well. This is a spherical lens, um, or a, in this case a circular lens in three dimensions. It would be a part of a spherical surface. It would be a hemisphere, and it doesn't do a very good job. In fact, lenses only work when their surfaces are curves that are only rather small portions of spheres. In fact, ideally, they should be some other shape but we tend to make lenses essentially spherical, and they, to a pretty good extent, then bring light together at a single focus, as does uh, my lens 2 here, for example. By the way, you may have heard of the lens defect called spherical aberration. Um, that's due to the fact that spherical lens surfaces are not exactly perfect at bringing light together at a focus, and spherical aberration measures just a little bit how far off they are from that. Lenses suffer from a number of defects, Spherical aberration is a common one. Um, they also suffer from the fact that different colors of light are refracted by different amounts, and consequently um, they may bring different colors to focus at slightly different points, causing colored images to be slightly out of focus. Um, some lenses, again, in two dimensions, it's not an issue, but in three dimensions, a lens may have one curvature in one direction, a slightly different curvature in the other direction, so the focal lengths will be different for parallel light coming in two different planes. Um, that's called astigmatism. Many of you may have astigmatism in your eyes. It means your lens is not perfectly circular, but has a cylindrical aspect to it. It's got more curvature in one direction than another. So real lenses, including the ones nature has provided us with, or the ones that we manufacture technological suffer from a variety of these defects. Now, how do these lenses form images? All I've done with my demonstration lenses over here so far is to show you how parallel light is brought to a single focus. Uh, to understand image formation, it suffices to know just two things about lenses, and those two things are fairly obvious from what's going on over here on the board. First of all, if I have a light ray that passes right through the center of the lens, it comes out approximately undeflected. You can see that's pretty strictly true for the one that's going right through the center here, but even if the light rays were not parallel, 
the one that's going through the center, it's deflected a little bit. Let's get that one a little better centered. The one that's going through the center is deflected a little bit, and then it comes back out in exactly the same direction it was going because the two surfaces of the lens at that point are essentially parallel. So a light ray that passes through the center of the lens, whether it does so parallel to the lens axis or not, comes out essentially undeflected. That's not exactly true because the thickness of the lens offsets it a little bit. So in the, in the approximation that lenses are very, very thin, thin compared to what? Thin compared to their curvature radius, then that will be true. So one thing you need to remember about lenses is any, lens that pass, any light that passes through the center of the lens, undeflected. On the other hand, as I showed with my first lens demonstration, any light that passes parallel uh, to the lens axis comes through and is deflected to the focus. Let's make that happen again. So here it is. And that's really all we need to know. Two things about light passing through lenses. Light that passes through the center of the lens comes through undeflected, and light that passes through parallel to the axis of the lens comes through and is deflected to the focus. That's all we need to know. So let's move on and take a look at how images are formed. First, I'm going to erase these focal lengths because we won't need them anymore. So let's take a look at how images actually form. Here I've got a picture that shows a single lens and I'm going to now try now to form an image of an object. All I did on the board over there was look at focusing of parallel light rays. I didn't say anything about images, about objects that are trying to be imaged, that we're trying to form images of. So here we go. Here's a, a, a lens. Here's its focal point. I need to know where its focal point is to figure out how it's going to make images. There's that lens axis. Uh, light rays passing parallel to that axis will be deflected through the focal point. Light rays passing through the center of the lens will go through undeflected. Here's an object. Typically, we draw very simple objects when we're talking about imaging, maybe a tree, maybe an arrow. And all we really need to do here is to figure out where light from the tip of the arrow is going to end up. If we're to form an image, an accurate, well-focused image, then all the light rays that are leaving the point of the arrow have to end up at the same place. Similarly, all light rays leaving the bottom of the arrow have to end up at the same place, but that's going to happen very simply. You can almost see that from the symmetry of the situation. So we're going to focus on the light leaving the tip of the arrow. We want to know where that light ends up. So here comes a ray of light that's moving parallel to the lens axis. We know what happens to light that moves parallel to the lens axis. As the demonstration on the board shows, it's brought to a deflected state that takes it through the focal point. So here it goes. So light from the tip of the arrow that happens to be moving parallel to the lens uh, axis ends up going through the focal point. Now there's light coming from the tip of that arrow in all directions. Presumably it's illuminated by the sun or by some light source. It's coming out in all directions, but some light ray is going parallel, and that light ray is going to be deflected through the focal point. Some other light ray leaving the tip of that arrow is going to be heading in just the right direction to take it through the center of the lens. And again, in the approximation that the lens is very thin, thin compared to the curvature radius of those spherical surfaces that make up the lens, that ray goes through undeflected. Of course, it gets a little tiny bit deflected in and deflected back out, but the deflection is very, very small. So all I need to draw, do is draw that second ray, the one that is, if, that is uh, coming off the tip of the arrow in such a direction that it goes through the center of the lens. There it is. And those two rays meet at a single point. And I'm not going to prove it here rigorously, but if we drew every other ray that came off that arrowhead and went through the lens, if the lens is working correctly, if it's got nice spherical surfaces, uh, all those other rays will also end up crossing at exactly that same point. So by knowing those two special rays, the one that runs parallel to the lens axis and the one that goes through the center of the lens, we have everything we need to know to reconstruct the image. Now it's pretty obvious that light from the bottom of the arrow coming along the axis of the lens has to end up on the axis of the lens, and consequently uh, we know that the bottom of the arrow is going to end up on the axis. We now know where the tip of the arrow's image is going to be. It's going to be at the point where those two rays cross, and so we can draw the image, and there it is. This particular formation of an image is a formation of an enlarged image. The image arrow is larger than the uh, actual object itself, and the image is inverted. It's upside down. And this particular image is called a real image. It's called a real image because, in a sense, it's really there. If you were to look into this system from what is the right in this diagram, you would actually see light leaving the tip of that image arrow. There is actually light coming from where that image is. That's why it's called a real image. 
You might say, is there such a thing as an unreal image? Well, there is, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But this particular one is a real image, and it's a magnified real image, and it's inverted. If I were, for example, to put a uh, white, reflective white screen at the place where that real image is, I would see the image on the screen. In fact, this is a rather crude model of a movie or a slide projector. In a movie or a slide projector, the object is the transparency, the slide or movie. It goes into the projector upside down. A large real image is formed on a distant screen, and the uh, real image is right side up because the object itself was upside down. The image is always inverted. Um, in a real movie projector or slide projector, the object is much, much closer, uh, and um, the image is formed much further away and has much greater magnification, but that's how that kind of lens works. Your eye also works this way. It forms a real inverted image on the retina at the back of your eye, and a camera forms a real inverted image on either film or, more in modern cameras, a charge-coupled device, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So that's the formation of a real image. Um, well, what about objects that have... Uh, not, what about non-real images? Well, there are non-real images, and they're called virtual images. And one can form a virtual image by putting an object closer to the lens than the focal point. In this diagram of real image formation, you'll notice that the object is a little bit further away than the focal point. As I move it in toward the focal point, the real image moves further out and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But if I put the object right at the focal point, a real image never forms. The light rays are made parallel, and they just travel off to infinity and never form an image. And if I move the object in even closer than the focal length, something interesting happens. So here it is. So here's a lens. Could be the same lens. Uh, the object is in very close to the lens. We're going to apply the same rule. It's in closer than the focal length. There's the focal point. We know that light rays leaving parallel to the lens axis go through the focal point. So there's a light ray leaving parallel to the lens axis. It's brought through the focal point, just like before. We also know what happens to light rays that uh, go through the center of the lens. They come out undeflected. So there's a light ray coming through the center of the lens. The problem is the object is so close to the lens now, closer than the focal distance, that those two rays don't converge. They don't form an image. They don't come to a single point where they cross. In fact, they're diverging. They're spreading apart. But here's what's interesting. If you were looking into this picture from the bottom right, looking at those light rays, it looks like they are coming from a common point. That common point is up here. It looks like they're coming from that point. They aren't really coming from that point. They're really coming from the object, and then the lens is doing funny things to them and deflecting them. But it looks like they're coming to that common point. So it looks to you, looking into the lens that way, like there is an enlarged object. You can see it's enlarged because the height of the object is much greater. And that image, which is an image which you see when you look through a lens at an object which is on the other side of the lens, much closer than the focal distance, is called a virtual image. Virtual because it's not really there. There is not really light. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's an image. But there's nothing really there. There's no light coming from there. It only looks as though light's coming from there. And a very common use of virtual uh, image formation is to take an object like a magnifying glass. Here's a nice antique lens that preserves as a magnifying glass. And uh, look at, for example, my notes here. And what I see is in a large picture of my notes, I'm seeing a virtual image of my notes. The image is behind the lens somewhere, or the light looks like it's coming from behind the lens, but light isn't really coming from the point where the virtual image seems to be. But nevertheless, I see this enlarged enlargement of the, of the text on the notes from this simple magnifying glass. This same lens could make both real images and virtual images, depending on whether the object is placed closer to the lens than the focal distance or further away. So that's the formation of a virtual image. Now, you'll notice that with both these images, I used exactly the same kind of lens. It was a, a lens that was concave, it, 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 uh, a convex, I'm sorry, it was a convex lens. The, the sides of the lens both bulged out. By the way, it would have still worked if one side had been flat and another had bulged out. It even would have worked if one was concave and one was convex, provided the lens got thicker in the middle. That kind of lens is called a converging lens. It brings parallel light rays together at a focus. There's another kind of lens called a diverging lens. And let me go over to my blackboard again and put on a diverging lens. Here, here's a converging lens. 